Maybe yes, our prayer calendar. So at the table, and it starts this Sunday. So you'll know specific ways you can pray for VBS. And our kickoff event to get the week started is our carnival. And so we have several spots where you can serve. We want you to be a part of that awesome night, but also invite your friends. This is a great way to expose them to what Vacation Bible School is all about. We have several events coming up in the next few weeks. One of those big ones, outdoor game night for families. It's gonna be a lot of fun at one of my favorite parks in Allen. And then sports camp will be the week right after VBS. So moms, if you're looking for something to keep your kids busy, but also they're going to learn about Jesus and have fun, check out Sports Camp. The website's full of all the information. Hey, church family. It's Memorial Day, and I am excited about keeping you connected, whether you're in person or online. And you may be asking, why are you mentioning online? Well, let me tell you, this is the first Sunday we are going to be live streaming our services because we want to keep you connected as you go out and vacation and you're away on the weekends. You can tune in on Facebook and on our church website and be a part of what God is doing right now as the service is going on. We're excited about this opportunity because we want to keep you in the loop of what God is doing here at FB Sound. Now, this summer, as you're gone on vacation, there are two ways that you're going to be able to stay connected to our church family. That's through our first look that goes out every weekend. It has all of our upcoming events. It has what we're planning, what's coming up to sign up for. You want to be a part of that first look. And we have a texting service. There's going to be a QR code that you can just scan, and it will take you to a page where you can put your phone number, your email address, and we can stay connected with you and let you know about all the things that are upcoming. Be sure to sign up for our first look and our texting service because that is the best way for you to stay connected to FBC Allen Weekly. We love you. We're excited about what God is doing this summer. Let's stay connected. This stone represents a life. A life unwilling to accept oppression. One given in the fight for freedom. With selfless courage, a sacrifice made to bless others. They did not stand alone, but with valor and bravery, Countless more joined the cause to protect our nation. They answered the call and surrendered everything to ensure liberty and hope for generations to come. As we remember the fallen, the magnitude of lives lost can be overwhelming. But let us not forget that each of these is a beloved son or daughter, a brother or sister, a parent, a spouse, a neighbor or friend. This stone represents a hero, a precious life given to defend ours. It is, it is Memorial Day, and we celebrate Memorial Day, and uh, it's, it's called a celebration, but for a lot of people, it's a, it's a tough day because they have someone in their life who did, who paid the ultimate price for the freedoms that we are able to share and they're able to have as a nation to gather here and to worship our God and to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we are thankful uh, for, for those um, who, have, who have served, who gave their life. Thank, we're thankful for those who continue to serve and uh, who, who've said yes to that call, and we're so grateful for that. And what we want to do is we just want to have a special prayer time, uh, not only for, for those who've lost loved ones, but also just to pray for those who are right now serving uh, and, and family members as well. And so we've asked Roger Schwarzenbach to come up and... Is Roger where? There he is. Hi, Roger, right in front of me. Roger is uh, a, a retired colonel in, in, in the Air Force, and uh, we're thankful for Roger and his service and so many of you who have served as well. But Roger's going to lead us in this prayer time. Thank you, Roger. You pray with me. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you for life and breath on this day, Lord. We gather to worship you, sing praises to your name, hear your message for us today, and to celebrate freedom. We thank that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who gifted us with salvation 
buried our sins, past, present, and future, when he died on the cross, paying the cost for our sins, and blessed us with an indescribable freedom, life eternal with Jesus Christ. Christ was the first to give his life for our freedom. Freedom is not free. We thank you for our forefathers who founded our great nation on the principles you have given us, Lord. Today, Lord, we observe Memorial Day, a day of remembrance set aside by our government to remember and honor the courageous men and women who faithfully gave their lives defending our country, personally paying the price which affords you and I the privilege of freedom which we cherish today. We don't know the names of all those patriots, Lord, but you do, and we ask that you comfort their families, friends, loved ones, plus give us all peace and hope for the future. We also think of those serving America today, praying for their protection and safety, but also that your Holy Spirit would lead them to freedom in Jesus Christ, setting them free from sin and the binding chains of this world. Help us, Lord, not to take our freedom for granted, but to use us to further your kingdom. Lastly, Lord, grant us hearts that are filled with gratitude, love for what you and our heroes have given us, knowing, Lord, that it was not in vain. Bless America, Lord, and thank you for making us Americans. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Roger. And we are grateful for our Lord and Savior who loved us. And I love Roger's prayer that he bought our freedom, our freedom from sin and freedom from, from spending eternity separated from him. And so we celebrate him today. We worship him today. And we echo the words of King David in a, a psalm in First Chronicles chapter, 5, chapter 16. It says this. It says, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among the peoples. Page turn. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell about all his wondrous works. Honor his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. And that's what we're going to do right now. We want to rejoice. We want to sing. And we want to seek his face. Let's stand together and let's worship. You, my God, have saved my soul.
bursting out with songs of praise. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. Good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Go ahead and be seated for just a moment so you can kind of relax a little bit, and then I'm going to ask you to stand up again, right? It's always good to get a little bit of, of that. It is so good to be back. Those of you who wonder, who in the world is this guy up there? My name is Preben Vong. I'm the pastor here during your interim uh, season when you are looking for a full-time pastor. I've been here a little bit, but I've been gone for a couple of times here uh, teaching another group of pastors uh, in New York City where we literally saw things that they said, oh, it's kind of nice to live in a place where you have a driveway you can drive in, yes? <laughs> and, and people who are doing ministry in the toughest and toughest of areas, people that are doing ministries also in areas that are so diverse that they can't even begin to describe it, some where you step into a place, and it might as well have been in, in uh, Southeast Asia someplace, not a one speak English, not a one store looks like anything you've seen before. On and on and on, we just saw how God's grace is phenomenal. Yes? We are part of this, friends. And I want to say welcome to those of you who are watching from, from someplace, uh, whether you're at home or whether it's even now or later on, uh, we just want to welcome you into worship. Can I remind you also, Memorial Day, for some people say, well, that's the beginning of the summer. So that's when, you know, I take a rest from everything, including God. Don't do that. Yes? Whenever you're in town, we see you here. When you're traveling, we see you there, uh, online, or, or someplace where you can worship God. It is just good to be in God's house, is it not? I wanted to feel, you know, the sense of we are here together. We're beginning kind of a new series now uh, in the next uh, several weeks uh, where we'll talk about uh, the Colossian uh, letter that Paul wrote under that word necessity. There's something that is necessary to truly see and experience the presence and the power of God. And he speaks about this. But for now, I want everyone to feel the warm, warm welcome if you see someone, you don't remember their name, just be honest. Say, I flat forgot. I've seen you a hundred times, but I forgot, right? Let's stand, find someone, give them a handshake, give them a hug, however that works. Tell them it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Amen. 
just a few moments in prayer. So, you know, uh, in 2024, we have been picking different prayer prompts for each month. And so I would encourage you to go to our website and check those out. Um, but have you ever uh, picked something out and then the Lord was showing you that you were really struggling with those things that you should be praying for? Um, so forgiveness and distractions were the ones that I uh, picked out from the list. And I have to tell you, I had someone reveal to me this week that I was really harboring some unforgiveness. So I don't think it's an accident that I'm up here uh, with you also praying this. Um, but our first prayer prompt, it'll be on the screen. Pray that God would give you a heart of forgiveness for those in your life who may have wronged you. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to guide us in a prayer. And so I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think of maybe that person that you are struggling to forgive, or maybe it's a group of people. And I want you to imagine that Jesus is holding his hands out, and he's saying, give me all those things that you've been holding on to, all the wrongs, maybe all the hurts, all the things that this person or people have maybe said or done that have been painful. And I pray that you'll allow him to take those. And Lord, I also pray that we would not only let you have those burdens, but also, Lord, that you would help us <clears throat> to see this person or people in your eyes, Lord, the way that you love us and the way that you also give us grace, Lord, I pray that we can return the same to that person or people that have hurt us. Lord, we give you these into your hands, and Lord, this for unforgiveness that we've been holding on to, Lord, I just pray that you'd fill it with your peace and your love. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time that we get to just slow down and pray. But, Lord, I help you pray that you help us specifically with unforgiveness and pray that we would be able to lay these burdens in your hands. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. And this next one is going to be about distractions. Any of you feel like you got some distractions going on in your, in your life? Um, pray that God would remove obstacles or distractions that are keeping you from growing in your relationship with him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you spend some time in prayer, and then I'll close this. But um, this is something, again, that I've just been really struggling this week. It's hard for me to let my brain slow down. So I'm going to pray that you can have a moment to pray, and then I'll close this in prayer. Lord, we pray that you would shut down any notifications, any texts, any emails, any phone calls, any, anything that's going on in our brains right now that's just causing us anxiety or worry or fear. Lord, I pray that you would stop them so we can be open and free to worship and open to hearing what you want to share with us today through worship. Lord, I pray that you would take away these distractions. Lord, we put those in your hands too. 
And we just pray that we can focus on you through this worship service. Lord, again, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together in a building and pray with one another. We love you so much. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. There is a song, I know it well, a melody that's never failed on mountains high, in valleys low. My soul will rest, my confidence in you.
Father, it's come this morning, we say hope is a name, and it's your son, Jesus, Father. We, we have access to the cross because of him dying to relieve that from us, Father, so we may live in you and for you. There will be a day, it's already come, our hope is complete, our home is going to be in your glory, Father. We bow our lives, we fix our eyes to you and your son, Jesus. God, we just lift that to you this morning. We thank you for, for being the almighty, the wonderful, the magnificent, the holy Father. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, it really is so very good to, to see you again and to be here. It was a great joy, you know, when you're gone and to know that you're going to be back at first, Alan. Uh, and I just want to say there's something special about that, uh, that I could spend every day, uh, although we were gone, to pray for you and know that there will be some of you praying for us. And, um, and it's just, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I want to speak to you uh, today and the next several weeks, um, through June actually, from uh, the letter Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Uh, where he himself had not been when he wrote this letter. And so <clears throat> there's something very important, and there's something that's easy for us to kind of miss, I think, with some of that. Our lives are somewhat comfortable, right? So just to kind of give you a taste, we were all these different kind of places uh, in, in very kind of dire situations. Also, deliberately, our mornings were filled with academic kind of stuff, like, you know, we're doing a doctoral degree. And afternoons, we're in the trenches trying to see how do pastors and ministers actually deal with things in a difficult situation. So we are on this place in Bronx where you, you prefer to be a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Um, and just talking to, to this pastor, young pastor, who had moved in, uh, with his wife into an apartment right there in the very hub of the most crime-ridden area probably in the USA. And so some were asking him, so, so what's going on? And say, you got to trust the Lord. It's, it's not easy. You know, some people sometimes get shot out right, right here in the street where we live. And, and they have, you know, domestic violence run rampant everywhere. Uh, and, and human trafficking happens in several of these places around, and, and on and on. He listed some of these kinds of things. And, and you know, uh, faces of, of many of those who live nicely in, in, um, in areas that had seen none of that um, suddenly began to kind of uh, whiten. Is that a good way of saying that? A paling uh, and saying, how do you find the strength and the power and, and the word that comes up, you got to trust God, right? Can I speak this to you in, in a strong way? So there are certain things in life, many things that are really, really good. Things that you do because they're good things to do. You know, you call your friend or you, you, you love on your neighbor or, or you, you go buy something that is good. It's good. It's not necessary, but it's good. There are other things that are very, very helpful. Uh, and you do them because they're helpful. And you can think, you just think through all the many kinds of things you're doing that are really helpful. But they're not necessary. You know, you may sleep an extra hour, and that's very helpful. You may take, a, you know, an aspirin or something if you have a headache and it's, it's helpful. But if you have a serious heart condition and you need one particular pill at a particular time of day, that's not just helpful. That's necessary. You seeing the difference? And so I think what Paul is doing, and I was thinking about what should I call this series? Should I just call it, you know, like, like, like we have done earlier also by using the fresh uh, word of being refreshed. And, and there's a lot of power and important things in that. But I thought Colossians is really about Paul telling this church that there are certain things that are not just good, they're not just helpful, they're not just things that, that are really kind of useful in many ways, they are necessary. And so we want to start uh, with some of that, and that is true also here, as Paul saying that, uh, for our faith. The letter to the Colossians is full 
of necessary words. So I'll say today we're going to deal with the necessary word of truth. So let me read the first eight verses of, of the letter to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. We always thank, uh, we always thank God the Father for your, uh, for our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, sorry, uh, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this from Epiphras, our dearly beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Think about what's going on here. Look at verse 6 again. If you have your Bible open and it comes to here, just see how he begins here with this, right? Uh, the gospel... He's talking about the gospel right here. You already heard about the hope of the word of truth. It is bearing fruit, and it is growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate it. All over the world. This is a faith that is lived out. There's no kind of a privilege here of turning faith into something that is just a matter of, of belief systems that happens in your brain. And, and you see that when you're in the real trenches of where faith matters. It, it, you can't reduce it just to a debate about what is right and wrong in your head. It is what has transformed lives. If you really share your gospel with people, share your faith with people uh, that, that have no real understanding of who God is, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, so what difference does it make? They're not going to ask, what exactly do you think about the Trinity or, or how do you define this kind of theological issue? They are asking, what change does it affect? in your life. How is it that my life will be truly impacted in a good way when I come to faith in Jesus Christ? And that is kind of what he's, what he's doing right here. See, he's writing to this church in Colossae, and what had happened there was that, that uh, they come to faith, and then, uh, you know, other kind of ideas had come in, and, and they had reduced their understanding of faith and their understanding of Christ to something that is helpful, something that is useful, something that is good, but not something that is exclusively necessary. You know, it, it is good. Christ can even be central to one's understanding of things, but not in a way where you kind of say, well, this is what matters, and other things are not, not all that important. That, that is exactly what had happened there. Culture had entrenched in such a way that Christ was part of the mix. He was not the fullness of it all. And so some of them even were beginning to question Epiphras, who was their pastor, and they say, you know, after they hadn't met Paul, and, and, and they were kind of, uh, questioning and saying, you know, what Epaphras is saying is, is not wrong, but it's not all that there is. There are other things too, other ways of kind of coming to God, other ways of understanding the spiritual life, other helpful things. Even if he claims that Christ is important, he's not exclusively all important. Are we getting this? This speaks so much and has so much power in our situation. If that is not exactly what happens uh, when we look at the world today, especially in comfortable areas, 
uh, somewhat also like ours, it is such a, a temptation to make Christ what we speak about, and, and we have him part of the mix. But after all, I also learned this over here, and I take this philosophy here, and I do a little bit of this here, and, and my culture doesn't have to change. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that I have to change my lifestyle. And Paul says, oh, yeah, it does. Oh, yeah, it does. What Epaphras has taught you is the whole truth and the fullness of truth. Everything is found in Christ. And so here we are. Paul is telling the Colossians, giving them a word, a necessary word of truth. Just look at it right here in verse 5, right? You have already heard about this hope in what? The word of truth, which is the gospel. So what he's telling them is that when the faith in Christ and the love for the saints and the hope in the resurrection, I mean, in the hope in the return of Christ, live among us in the strongest way. We will see that that changes the way we think about that. So let me, let me uh, unpack this and let us hopefully see this as not just good advice, not just a kind of a great word to kind of be reminded of, but that this is a necessary word to find the kind of power, the kind of strength, and the kind of spirit presence that we see all over. I hope you have noticed when you look at this text, and all I'm going to do, friends, is just kind of preach the Bible. Just say, what does it say here, and try to unpack some of these things, right? Paul begins with what we may call the very constitution of faith. You see that right there? He, he begins with this kind of a holy kind of tripod, if you will, uh, and some of you would have seen that when you've seen some of these major houses being built. Have you seen that they, they knock these kind of uh, pillars down in the earth, right? Have you seen that? If you haven't seen it, go to Florida. Every house has that, right? And they just bounce through the sand, keep doing it. Some of them are massively long, and they keep that for days and weeks, hammering that down. Well, there are three of those that, that are tripod as foundational in the Christian faith, and that is, of course, faith in Christ. It is love for the saints, and it is hope in the return of Jesus. And that is really what we see uh, going on here. That's where he begins, and I want to kind of deal with this uh, as this foundational point, and when that is missing, we are missing so much. And Paul begins there for a reason, and he wraps this here as part of the thanksgiving. We always give thanks to God for you because, and then come, here it comes, right? your faith in Christ and your, your love for the saints and your hope. So that's what is, what is going on uh, with this here. So if we unpack this and look at that as one thing at the time, because what you will see is that these things go together. I don't know if you thought about that. You can't take one of them out, right? You, we all know that from a tripod. If you remove one of the legs, it's just going to fall down, right? If you just have one, of course, it can't stand. Two can't stand. Three will never wobble. It just won't. You know, if you don't believe me, try it. It will not. doesn't matter how uneven this is the bottom. It will not wobble. And so when you take just, for example, two of them together, you're going to miss something. If you take faith and hope alone, for example, you're going to have this kind of wishful, dreamy thinking, I hope this and I, I believe it, so it must be true. No, it's not. It just lands you someplace where you don't have to really care for what is around you. You just live in your dream world. What if you take just faith and love? Well, that would end in some kind of social type religion. I, I just, you know, believe that it's important to show my love to everybody, and that is good. But it would leave you without that kind of uh, significance that would continue request that you go to Jesus to ask for his help. What about then hope and love on, on their own? Well, if you do that, then you have no real rooting 
in Christ. But when you put the three together, friends, they will work in such a way, infusing each other with power and strength and life, that you can see a genuine, new, strong, spiritual life become yours. That's why the foundation is so important. And it begins with faith. Of course, it's not loose-hanging faith, right? We've kind of gotten used to this. Just believe like in yourself or believe you can do this. That's never biblical. Faith is always faith in Christ. Trust that he has the power and he has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. It's always that. It's never loose-hanging kind of faith. So this word of truth is introduced with this word about faith. And it, it is about what it means to truly come to a conviction that life happens in the power of the presence of Jesus. You know, it, it is one of the paradoxes of the Christian faith that is at one of the time, same time, you know, uh, our Lord is requesting that we have faith, that is, that we trust him in what he says and what he does. And at the same time, that faith is generated in our heart by his grace. So there's a certain thing that preceded that has to do with the conviction that Christ truly is the Son of God, that he truly died for us, and that he truly rose again, that he's really actually seated at the right hand of the Father and judging the living and the dead. But the faith that we have here goes far deeper than just that kind of convictional thing. The faith that Jesus always talks about when he speaks is a faith that is visible, that it reveals the actual presence of God's grace in someone's life. The work of the Spirit, if you will, we can put it that way, is recognized by the presence of that kind of faith that steps out where it cannot reach the bottom on its own. This is really what's going on and the way it makes a difference to say Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just in some kind of sense, Lord and Savior, who take care of me at the end. It's not enough to say I believe in God. It's not enough to say I have spiritual kind of experiences. It's not enough to say I can pray and the sick get healed or I can speak in tongues and, and it's like speaking directly to God. What Paul is saying here is that those who are saying, well, this thing about Christ is good, but not quite sufficient. There's so many other things also. Paul is saying, no, you need to trust that Christ is sufficient. You have faith, not in your own ability, not in some kind of eff, you know, uh, loose hanging kind of ideas, ephemeral stuff, but in Christ. It turns out to be faithfulness. Look at what, how he opens the very letter. He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are what? who are faithful brothers. That word saints is a, it really just an English translation of the word holified. Those who have been made holy by God and those who are faithful brothers and sisters, not just those who are. So it, is, it becomes a really important thing. Not only those who have the name, but those who have the lifestyle. But let me go on and just kind of deal with some of this. There's so much in this, and I, I'm looking at the clock here. Love is another part of that tripod. And, and as it describes here, it speaks to the love that we have for all the other believers. Of course, there's a love that, that everybody has. I mean, it's, it's not impossible to love when you're not a Christian. As sometimes I hear pastors say, you know, you know, only Christian can really love. I, that's not the point. I know very wonderful non-Christian people who love their spouses and their family, and they're just fantastic people. 
Don't, don't mess this up. They, they are. They, they can respect non-Christian friends, respect each other deeply and all that. That's not what we are talking about. What we're talking about here and what Jesus, uh, Paul here is, is focusing on is the kind of love that is uniquely Christian, that is so deep that it can't happen without the power of the Spirit, the kind of thing that makes it possible for someone to sit and enjoy it with someone they don't even know well. So we come together to worship here. Whether you're in jeans and t-shirt or you're in a full suit, whether you're rich or poor, whether you smell nice or you're pungent to sit next to, whether you, you are, are black or white or any kind of shade in, in between there, whether you have you know, no education really or you are like a rocket scientist, whatever that may be, together, young, old, everyone sits together and bound together by love. Are we hearing this? I'm not saying bound together by we sit in the same pew and it's okay, that's okay. But that we actually love one another. You can deeply love someone just because they are your brothers or sisters in Christ. That's the uniqueness. That cannot happen outside of the Spirit of God. And that is actually the visible the visible expression of God's grace in your life. That there is a love that goes to all the saints. And then look. Look at the last hope. Verse 4. We heard about your faith in Christ, your love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope that is ready for you or prepared in heaven. Just think of this. Some of us think of it the opposite of what the Bible says here, right? Faith and love, according to this text, find its nourishment from hope. Do we see this? Because of the hope you're living that way huh? because of the hope that is there. There's a deep sense of God has put us together and when we see these great snippets of, of greatness, when we experience a love that we don't know really, when we have the best day we have ever had in our lives, when everything that kind of looks up, we get a little snippet. But even that best day you ever had in your whole life, will look merely like deep depression compared to the blessings that await. This is it. Because of the hope, we know what will come, friends, yes? And we see that, and it gets pulled back in. And we are allowed by God's grace to see just snippets, just little fragments, just little kind of corners, glimpses, or what will be, and it will be so much more. So let us not ever lose that. The Christian life must be filled with Christian hope. Not long, don't confuse that. Not long for once upon a time, or, you know, it'll be better in the end, that kind of longing. No, right now, that hope is what fills our life at this moment with strength and power to do this. I'm going to say just a couple of words and then I'll round it up here about hope. We go to, to uh, the, the letter to, to the Hebrews. Hope there is defined as the anchor of the soul. Just think about this. Because without that anchor, life is kind of drifting around in the open sea with no direction and no ground. When you go to the prophet Joel, he calls it for the harbor, and kind of the image there is that, that the harbor is this place where you come in from the raging sea and find kind of peace. You get your, your storage rooms filled back up, and you get repaired and ready to, 
sail again on the sea. And Hosea, the prophet, calls it for a door, right? The hope is like a door. And it kind of suggests that, that life without hope is like being in a room where there's no exit, no way out. Paul calls it a helmet, and he points to the protective qualities of hope. Peter talks about a living hope because the real, the real hope connects us to the Christ who has conquered death. We can go on and look at this. But it is a necessary word, friends. Not a good word, not an important thing, not a useful word, but a necessary word of truth that your life needs to be anchored in genuine faith in Christ, in true love for the saints, and in the hope that comes from heaven itself. That's constitution. That's the ground for our citizenship in the kingdom of God. And so can I say this just at the end? It bears fruit where? In the whole world. Do you see that? That always blows me away. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. Some of you are timid when you share your faith. Or maybe it's just me, you know, I need it, and this is kind of my crutch, and this is my, I need it. And people may say that to you. But this is God's truth. Everywhere it is, it grows. It grows with extraordinary power. There, there is not a soil. There is not a climate. There is not a place where it does not have the power to sink its root and bring out new life. Yes? I, I hope you hear this, friends. There, it is too easy to kind of get lost, and yet we add this on. This is the point. The power of this is so strong, that gospel, that it can bear fruit anywhere, everywhere, in all people's lives, in every tribe, in every geographical area of the globe. In fact, it is so strong that in the world they used to not be Christian. There are now more Christians than other things. Have you heard that? Have you thought of that? There are now more Christian missionaries be sent out from the global south than from the historic global north where that has been Christians before. I hope you hear what Paul, what Scripture, what God is speaking. I've tried to not say anything beyond what the Word says here. But if we are to make the kind of difference that we can make, the kind of gifting that God has given us, with the kind of sense of necessary truth that is here. You all have neighbors. You all have friends. You all have workmates. You all have classmates. You all have all these things that need to see that this is a necessary word for human flourishing. You know, we live in a generation. We have it all. Don't we have it all? We have it all. More than any generation has ever had. We have everything, and yet we're not happy. We don't flourish. Because we don't have what truly matters. Father, I ask that your message from this text did not get lost in my feeble words. There will be some here this morning. There will be some watching that need to hear from you to get their lives together in a way that is only possible when it's being built on this kind of deep foundation. Faith in Christ. Love for the saints. And hope that comes from heaven. Father, may we know this. I pray for each here. I know so many have heard this in different ways. But may you speak by your spirit that it actually transforms our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing, friends. And, and as always, if you want a prayer and if you want to talk to someone, there will be some here or afterwards outside.
in the foyer, you either find a more mature Christian, find one of us from the staff, or whatever, we'd love to pray with you. If you're looking for a church home, someone else to stand shoulder to shoulder with, this is a great place to call home. There'll be a day my hope complete now home in glory your face i'll see my pain no more my fear will cease i bow my life i fix my eyes on christ my king coming today and being a part of this worship. I'm Teddy Schuler, and I'm the preschool minister. Um, what a powerful message, the message of how necessary our faith in Christ is. And it's compelling because if you know Christ, you have a story. And we're supposed to tell our story. God wants to use us all in small places and big places. And we have that to share. So as we go, think about your story and think about who you can share it to. Don't overthink it. Just share it because God will do the rest. Thank you so much for coming. Um, what a wonderful message. Hope you guys have a wonderful holiday. I know the staff will be in the rotunda and um, happy to meet with you, pray with you. Um, you guys have a great week and you are dismissed.